conditions that cause kidney disease. If you have diabetes, high blood pressure, or a family member with kidney disease, you are at risk. If you are overweight or over 50, you are at risk. And certain ethnic groups are also at higher risk. Please talk to your family doctor and have your kidney function checked regularly. This is Rogers TV, Fredericton. This program is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details. Hello, welcome to Voice of the Province. I'm your host, Troy Glover. Now tonight we have Chris Austin, leader of the People's Alliance of, for New Brunswick. Thanks for joining us tonight. Good to be here, Troy. And tonight we're talking about the current political climate of New Brunswick. Now, diving right into it, uh, a little over two weeks ago, the government announced plans to end some overnight ER services and then reverse the decision a week later. What exactly happened there? Well, uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we're still all trying to figure that out, and it depends on who you ask and what kind of answer you get. Um, <clears throat> the announcement was made on a Tuesday morning at 11 o'clock uh, in the press gallery and we got the briefing uh, the previous Thursday. So Thursday we got the briefing from the Minister of Health and uh, some of his team and at that briefing it was kind of laid out um, you know what was going to take place and included of course closure of ERs and six hospitals throughout the province it included uh, changes to how uh, those hospitals structure their beds, uh, long-term care, uh, acute care beds. Um, also included, you know, some good things like uh, digital health, moving towards that. Um, a difference in, in uh, environmental services, uh, food, you know, uh, uh, community events at these hospitals for those that, that are staying in the beds. Um, so, you know, there were, there were some good aspects of the plan, um, but, you know, when you talk about closing ERs uh, in any area of the province, it's, it's going to be met with swift backlash, and I'm not so sure the government was prepared for the amount of backlash that they got over it, not just from the public, but really even within their own caucus, as you know, uh, I mean, the Deputy Premier walked away from it, from, from the caucus, um, sat as an independent over this. Uh, the local ML, M, <coughs> excuse me, the MLA for Sussex, <coughs> he, uh, you know, raised some concerns and, and strong opposition to the plan. So, uh, yeah, there, there was a lot of concerns around it. Um, and, and here's the dilemma. You know, you've got a healthcare system in New Brunswick today that if you ask anybody, patient or doctor or manager, administrator, they'll all say the same thing. Healthcare in New Brunswick is in a crisis mode. So, you know, it's, it's, it's one of these situations where significant change has to happen, but the question is, is how does that change happen? And what is that change? How does it roll out? What's the plan? And unfortunately, I think with the rollout of this plan, uh, it, it, was, it was just botched right from the beginning. I mean, you've got, um, you know, no backup uh, necessarily in place for, these, for the closure of these ERs. For example, um, are more ambulances going to be staffed in the regions uh, to, to transport these patients to, to the next uh, ER? And if so, uh, is there compensation for the amount of response time? Because if you've got an ambulance now going from, say, Sussex into St. John, there's significant time uh, lapses that will be there where that ambulance is out of the community. So what takes its place? Uh, talk about transfers of patients from St. John to Sussex. All kinds of questions around that. And then you talk about nurses. Uh, the concern was, you know, there's nurses there that, um, you know, were maybe either nearing retirement or lived in the Sussex area that was not willing to move to St. John and that would just leave the profession. And I mean, the last thing New Brunswick needs is less nurses. We actually need desperately more nurses. So there, there was a lot of concerns. 
I mean, I, I understand both sides. I, I looked at the at the information as best as I could. Talked to we actually had the uh, CEO of Horizon Vitalite in the committee here on Wednesday. We had a chance to really, you know, ask those tough questions, and they were very blunt in their answers, which I appreciated because a lot of times you don't get straight answers. Um, but I think we did on this one. It was it was pretty blunt in their talk. Uh, didn't always agree with with a lot of uh, you know the the rationale for doing it, but I understand where they're coming from, and it's it's just one of those tough situations. Um, I think if government had have gone about it a little bit differently, rolled it out differently, had things in place, and <clears throat> and again instead of tackling six of these hospitals, um, you know I I just I don't think that was the right approach. Um, it, it certainly had the perception that rural New Brunswick was under under attack and. Uh, Anyway, it, it didn't go over well, which is why they walked it back. Yeah, um, over the original decision, mm -hmm. it apparently sent several rural communities just into panic mode. No, uh, for these rural communities, why do you think these services are so important to them? Well, again, it's it, a lot of it is, is just the fear of the unknown, right? I mean, if you're used to having an emergency care center in your community uh, overnight hours, you know that if it's three, two, three o'clock in the morning, <clears throat> you know your child falls ill, gets a, a fever that's uh, you know, and, and worrisome, or you know, you're working a night shift and you have an accident on the job, or whatever, whatever emergency you fall into, you know that you have that hospital there, you know, to to look at you. So I get it. Uh, a lot of fears around that, but you know, on the flip side, I, I look to my community in Minto. Um, Eighteen years ago, Minto, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> had a Minto had a uh, full 24/7 hospital. And I remember, uh, much younger then, but I remember when the closures came down. That, and it wasn't just a closure of the ER overnight. They come out and said, look, we're taking your hospital, your 24-7 emergency care hospital, and we're converting it into a community clinic. And I remember the outrage. I mean, it was, it was very clear. People were not happy with the protests. Everything went on. Um, but if you, if you go ahead 18 years to where we are today, I don't think there's too many people that would argue that that community health center in Minto is one of the best in the province. And you know, I use the example if if I go in there for any ailment or you know family member or whatnot, I can get into that clinic and I can be out in less than an hour. Uh, they provide most of the services that I need. Um, you know, so it's it's working well. But again, that's not to mitigate the concerns that these people have in these other areas. And um, Minto is not the same as a place like Sussex that has a bigger population. Uh, larger catchment area of, of patients that would be coming in and, and I'm sure uh, based on the numbers that we've seen they would see more patients at night than Mento ever would have seen anyway so you know it's it's not apples to apples when we compare the two but I do again it gives me perspective of both sides of, of the uh, discussion on this. Do you think that a lot for the rural areas as well that some of this uh some of this panic might have also been due since New Brunswick has such a large aging population as well mm -hmm. that they don't they didn't uh, a lot of uh, senior uh, New Brunswickers didn't know if they were going to be have their needs taken care of. Yeah, for sure. And 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 again, that's a legitimate concern. That's nothing to be brushed aside. And, and that I think that was a problem with the announcement. It was just it was kind of out of the blue. Everybody was talking about health reform, but nobody seen that coming. Um, you know, but I mean, if you're talking about uh, you know um, seniors and especially people that are in these hospitals, here's the problem we have in New Brunswick. At any given time, um, there's a large percentage of hospitals right now that have seniors in there that don't need to be in there. Mm -hmm. um, they're not necessarily sick. Uh, they don't need any type of, you know, acute care. Um, they need long-term care. Problem is, they're in a hospital setting. So you can imagine you've got a senior that's now living in a hospital, not a nursing home, mm -hmm. a hospital. You know, uh, uh, they're staring at the ceiling, you know, 24-7 a day, uh, a week. And you know they're being fed in bed. They're they're the only mobility you get is to walk around the hallways. It's it's just it's not, it's not a healthy thing for these seniors, uh, for these people that that live in these hospitals. So I understand Horizon's approach to try to transform the network, to say that certain hospitals will now be you know converted to to look after those with long term care and including, you know food services, entertainment. Uh, you know and again I use Minto for example. You've got a nursing home that's a, that's joined to the clinic. And uh, the volunteer organizations will come in, uh, provide entertainment to the seniors in a nursing home. Uh, you know, they're, they're able to get around a little bit. 
Um, it's just a different setting, and, and I, I understand that. It, it makes sense. Was there any discussion of plans going into the uh, going into this announcement? Where uh, where there were going where there were uh, any discussions on creating more uh, senior care homes to kind of supplement those that are currently staying in our hospitals? Well, I, I think from what I understand of the plan, it was to take some of those hospitals and convert them not into nursing homes. They'd still be a hospital. Mm -hmm but they would have enhanced services for those that are in the hospitals that don't need to be there, right? All so right. it's not about building new nursing homes, it's about taking the facility that you have, using it as a, as a quasi nursing home, if you can call it that, and you know, giving them the opportunity to have a, a little better of a, a living standard than it would be as a typical hospital, um, which again, uh, made sense to me. But um, I think the other element too is when we talk about ambulances and paramedics and response times in emergencies, the biggest thing that I've always struggled with, um, we, we fought long and hard for years uh, for New Brunswick to implement advanced care paramedics. Mm -hmm. And we finally won that battle, semi won that battle in under the uh, Gallant government where they introduced a pilot project to bring in advanced care paramedics. And I mean, you've got paramedics at work, they're, uh, there's your uh, basic primary care paramedics, they're great at what they do, mm -hmm. but then you have another level of advanced care paramedics that can provide you know, more medication, different types of drugs and medication to save your life. Uh, they can pr provide procedures that primary care paramedics cannot do, they're not licensed to do. I, I refer to them as like an emergency room on wheels. The problem with the plan when they rolled it out is they brought these advanced care paramedics to urban centers. Mm -hmm. And it didn't make sense to me because in urban centers you've got ERs that are close at hand. You know, you, you can get a primary care paramedic to take them to the emergency room where they can be treated. Rural areas don't have that. So why not take your advanced care paramedics, put them in the rural areas where they'd be better utilized. But uh, I think there's some changes coming. I've had many discussions with the Minister of Health uh, to see that broaden and uh, make sure that all the advanced care paramedics we have in this province are working to their full scope of practice because right now they're not. Now, you mentioned earlier that the fallout of this decision has also caused the Deputy Premier to resign uh, and leave the party now. Were you just surprised by their decision? Um, I kind of was. I, I have to be honest. Um, you know, again, there was, there was two, two in, the, in, the, in the PC caucus that had concerns with the plan. Obviously, uh, MLA Bruce Northrup, who represents the riding of Sussex, whose hospital was in his riding. Um, he did what any MLA would have to do. I mean, you, you know, you're, you're there as a representative of your people and you stand up and you oppose the changes. I, you know, I, I don't fault him one bit for that. He did what I would do or what anybody else would do as an MLA. Robert Govan is, is a little bit different because the hospital actually wasn't in his riding. It was, I think, 30 minutes outside of his riding. I understand there's some concerns and there's some close closeness between the hospital there and the people in his riding, but um, I, I'm not sure his approach was uh, the best way to go about it, um, but again, it, it you know it just shows some of the, the the division that is within government today, and and in a minority situation, it creates for a very uh, unstable uh, way to govern and and the way for the legislature to work. Now, between his resignation, resignation, uh, Bruce Northrup's. Uh, uh, vocal concerns uh, were that of himself and also the complaints from people probably in his <coughs> writing. Now do you think this, uh, like these actions caused the government to take a second look at this decision? Well what I always tell people, um, the benefit of a minority government is it, 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 it creates and allows for checks and balances. Mm -hmm. So government can't just plow through uh, the policy decisions, they can't just they're not given carte blanche to make decisions and, and, and not worry about the ramifications. Now, in a minority situation, if government's going to act on any policy, they have to consult with somebody. Uh, now, whether that's us, the Greens, or the Liberals, I mean, now we've been uh, positioned ourselves uh, to be at the table with government to be able to negotiate some of these, these contracts. The, the difference with this rollout is we weren't at the table. Mm -hmm. We were briefed on it a few days before, but I, I had no idea this, this was coming. And if I had of, you know, I would have uh, helped make some changes that, that wouldn't have seen it got to where it was. But that was, I think, a mistake on behalf of government to not work with uh, the other parties, uh, us, you know, uh, to, uh, to see those changes done in, in the right way.
Now, from the start, your party was vocal that ending duality was an important approach to reducing the costs of health care in the province. Mm -hmm. uh, were you disappointed that the government tried closing overnight services before you trying your approach first? Well, and, and, and this is what we've been saying. Now, now I'm not naive. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I've never said that duality is going to fix the health care system, yeah. okay? because there's a lot more to it than just that. But how can you make changes to a system when you've got two that you have to worry about? Mm -hmm. You know, I use the example if if you're if you have a, a, a household of income of you know thirty forty thousand dollars, and you're sitting with a Mercedes and a, and a BMW in your driveway, and you're scratching your head saying, you know, I, I can't seem to keep you know these vehicles afloat. Well, common sense would say you probably have to sell the vehicles and go to a vehicle that you can afford rather than paying for two. You pay for one. I mean, we do it every day in our lives. So governments need to do the same. And I'm not talking about taking away French hospitals or ending bilingualism in the hospital centers. That's not what we're saying. Actually, we're saying we'd like to see one bilingual health authority that falls under uh, the Department of Health and that all the hospitals operate under. So if you have a French hospital, that hospital continues to be French. There's no changes on, on the ground level, but administratively and in terms of having Horizon Vitality competing with one another for resources, now you've got one system that they're all pooling their resources together to work together. And that's what we've said. You've got to end duality in healthcare if you want to start fixing uh, the system. Now, had the government gone through with its plan, were we in a position to properly serve rural communities that would have been affected by the closures during the overnight hours? Well, and that was the problem with the plan. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't have the backup in place. Um, you know, if you're going to close an ER, you have to be assured that there's going to be more ambulances and paramedics on site, uh, that there's going to be more advanced care paramedics in the field, that people in those areas have other options. Now, nobody's going to like it. I mean, let's, let's just be honest. If, if you're about to lose your, your emergency center at night in a hospital, um, you know, there's going to be some, hopefully there'd be some trade-offs, but ultimately you're, you're not going to like it any way it happens. But you still have to have a well-communicated uh, uh, and you have to have a good framework so that when it happens, residents can be assured, you know, there is a backup here. You know, when you call an ambulance, you're not going to be waiting 40, 50 minutes for it to show up, uh, but that they're going to be there in a reasonable time and that when they show up, they're going to have the specialty, specialties, the licensing and experience to do advanced uh, uh, care procedures on you if you need it in an emergency situation, and none of that was rolled out. Now, did the would you say the government dropped the ball when it came to properly explaining uh, the reasoning is behind the plan rather like it publicly? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the government dropped the ball. I mean, everybody knows it. Government has even admitted it, mm -hmm. that it, it, was a, it was a failed rollout of the plan. Um, you know, so there's no secret there. They, they've, they've come to terms with that. Um, so it's, you know, again, it's, it's one of those things where when you, when you touch health care specifically, uh, you, you, you got to have your ducks in a row. You've got to make sure things are lined up and that people can at least understand what you're doing, why you're doing it, and what the trade-off is going to be. Um, because if you're going to take something, you have to give something back in, in return to enhance the service of the local area. And again, I use Minto for the example, the trade-off, we, we received services in Minto that we didn't have with the hospital, uh, which is working well for us in, in that area. Uh, now we do still have issues with, uh, with ambulance response times in, in some cases, but that needs to be worked on. And uh, you know, that can be worked on and made better. All right. Well, at this point, I'm going to say that we're going to have to cut to break uh, sure. for the meantime. So please stick with us as we continue to talk about the current political climate in New Brunswick. <laughs> Let's go get it! 
Go get the stick! I am tired of this. Wow. No! You're something. Hell yes. I'm not special. Cancer happens to people all the time. I take one mile at a time, 26 miles a day. I want to set an example that'll never be forgotten. Sometimes, it feels endless. But the pain I feel is nothing. I've seen little kids in so much pain. Somewhere, the hurting must stop. Terry Fox ran more than halfway across Canada to raise money for cancer research. Every year, millions of people around the world continue the marathon of hope in his name. Hello and welcome back to Voice of the Province. I'm your host, Troy Glover. Now tonight we have Chris Austin, leader of the People's Alliance for New Brunswick. And tonight we're pretty much just talking about the current political climate of the province itself. Now, were you surprised that uh, uh, Liberal leader Kevin Vickers was so aggressively open about bringing down government uh, when the plan was to go ahead with the overnight closures? Yeah, I mean, look, we've seen this dog and pony show before. Here, here, here's the thing, what, what these people that have been in politics for years, and I know Mr. Vickers is somewhat new to it, but the team around him is not, and I'm sure this was all part of the plan for them. They're missing the fact that New Brunswickers today, uh, and people today in general, not just New Brunswickers, all across really the globe, they're, they're, they're more aware of what they've known to be politics and what they want to see in politics. The reality is in 2018, the people of New Brunswick elected a minority government for the first time in over a hundred years. Now, it may be hard for the Liberals and sometimes the Conservatives to come to terms with that, but they, they better come to terms with it because I have a very strong suspicion that it's not going to change. People like minority governments and for good reason. It keeps the checks and balances in place, it makes sure that no one party has carte blanche to do what they want, they have to negotiate with somebody. And for Mr. Vickers to come out and, and talk about burning the place down uh, on an announcement of health care, and especially when the government rescinded that and said, well, no, we're going we're gonna to put the brakes on this plan and we're going to go and consult and talk to people and see where to go from there, um, you would think at that point they would say, well, you know, let's take a second look at this and let's collaborate, God forbid, uh, to make the legislature work. And, um, you know, the, the message that I'm trying to give New, New Brunswickers at this point is for the last 18 months, uh, we, and myself, Rick DeSaunier, Michelle Conroy, as a caucus, we have done absolutely everything we could to do a couple things. One, provide stability in government. Despite it being a minority situation, we wanted New Brunswickers to understand you can have a functioning government in a minority situation, a good government in a minority situation, and, and we've done everything we can to provide that. And secondly, to further the things that we were elected on. And we have made progress on the very things that we uh, campaigned on in the last election. You know, but again, the two main parties are, are having a hard time understanding that. They're so used to being in full control, full authority, excuse me, on their decisions and their plans. They, they're not used to having to answer to anybody else. And I think it's great for New Brunswickers that we've come to a place in this province where now they have to answer to somebody else. They can't just go, go it alone. They have to work with other parties. And, uh, you know, Mr. Vickers, he can, he can have his election. I'm fully ready to go. I, I'm convinced we, we will only gain seats um, out of this if, if they choose to go to an election. But um, I don't want to do the political thing. I want to do the right thing. And I think the right thing is to keep, uh, keep the legislature going uh, and collaborating and working for solutions together rather than uh, the divisive talk of Mr. Vickers and trying to bring the government down. Now we're going to go to the lines here for a second. We have Charles from Fredericton. Hello, Charles. 
Bonjour. Bonsoir. That name, Hello. that voice sounds familiar. <laughs> no, that's ridiculous. I, I can't get rid of this accent. You got a neck hole in, in the back. Just want to let you know. Anyway, the um, it, it, politics is very interesting here in New Brunswick. I've never seen anything like it in my life. But after what happened with the health care cuts, what... I mean, it's nice to see New Brunswickers rally together and, you know, we're not going to do this, blah, blah, blah. And Higgs, okay, I was, I, was, I was shocked that he backed off. I thought he was just going to go ahead. And, but really, what really amazed me, it's Mr. Vickers. I couldn't believe his attitude toward this issue. I mean, it was no, it's a, like Chris said, by the way, I'm not a member of the People Alliance Party, just for, just for the record. Uh, the way that uh, Kevin Vickers' uh, attitude toward, you know, like his face and eliminate, I mean, these are not officers. These are MLAs. You have to work together. And Mr. Vickers, uh, you know, I mean, he's shown that, uh <laughs> I don't know how liberals can go with if this budget is defeated and uh, go toward the next election to say elect our leader. He has no experience. And Chris Austin and David Kuhn has shown the all the revolving door, red and blue, red and blue, red and blue. Come on. I mean, uh, Jenica uh, Atwin, the MP of Fredericton, I mean, she's doing a wonderful job. So it's time for people to realize, never mind, especially my Acadian sisters and brothers from the North Shore, my great-great-grandfather voted liberal. I'm going to vote liberal also. They have to get their head out of the sand and say, hey, enough is enough here. Good, good point. And, uh, you know, I've used the example before. You know, I was raised in a home... Um, where my my dad was a strong PC, part of the PC association, so I, I had that conservative uh, roots. And then my stepfather, his family came from very strong liberal backgrounds. So I, I understood both sides of, of the equation, but what I can tell you is all of them uh, are very m much open to, to different views, and, and they've supported me in what I've done as, as a new party, because I think they, along with a lot of other New Brunswick, like Charles, is realizing that you know, there's, there's this red and blue game back and forth. Uh, it's it's not working for New Brunswickers, and we need you know some different voices in there, different perspectives, and again to have those checks and balances. So I, I think Charles, you, you you nailed it, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, the day that me and Chris Austin would agree on something, I mean, uh, we got to mark that date. Mer Was that do happen, Charles. Yeah, of course. <laughs> no, no. But I mean, it, you're doing. You got an echo again. Um, you're doing very, very good. And uh, he, he just continue to do what you're doing. And Higgs, when he was the leader of the uh, oh, uh, opposition, I remember he told Brian Gallant, invite me over. I'm the former finance minister. Invite me in the office so we could discuss the issue, the financial situation of the, the province. And you, you had some dealing with Mr. Higgs. And he's not, uh, okay, the stuff about the Irvings and all that, but he's an approachable guy that you, he likes to talk. Let's talk about the issue. Let's find a solution. And what Kevin Vickers did this week, I hope New Brunswickers, the New Brunswickers, the Acadian, the Acadian, see through this guy because this guy goes in power. Oh, my God, we're in trouble. Okay, you guys have a good night. Thank you very much, Charles, for calling in. Good point. All right. Um, now, there are some that say the current distribution of hospitals with emergency services in the province, are, within a province our size, uh, is simply un, like unsustainable. Do you agree with that statement? Well, when you talk to uh, the CEO of Horizon and Vitalite, uh, yeah, I mean that's that's what they say, and and you know they they have the data to show that it's it, it's unsustainable. Um, but I would counter and say what's equally unsustainable is again trying to keep two systems afloat and, and here's what I find frustrating 
if you had one system, one health authority, and you had all of your staff, um, all of your equipment, all of your resources under one system, you know, and, and that should be the first step. Then if you want to talk about, you know, unsustainability within that one system, then let's look at ways of making it, making it work. But everybody in the province of New Brunswick, whether you live in Fredericton, Moncton, St. John, or you live, you know, in the backwoods of, of the province, you have to have reasonable, accessible care. Um, you know, and, and, and I say reasonable, and, and I can tell you, being from a rural area, um, you know, I don't expect to drive five minutes down the road and have a fully functioning 24-7 emergency hospital where they can do anything and everything. Um, you know, in 2013, I underwent heart surgery. I didn't expect to have that done in Minto. That's ridiculous. I had no problem going to St. John, spending a couple days in St. John, where I had exceptional care because it's done in one center in the province. So centralizing in some ways makes sense, but you can't completely cut off the rural areas and uh, the health care that they deserve either. So there has to be that balance and uh, in striking that common ground for, you know, again, urban and rural residents that they get the quality care they need. Now, earlier this afternoon, CBC News published a report on a 2014 document in which health officials proposed far more drastic cuts than what was put forward by the government, including full closures of the six ERs and further emergency service cuts across the province. Now, do you think that was a propo that was uh, proposed a couple of week uh, weeks ago? Oh, sorry. Do you think what was proposed a couple of weeks ago was the first stage of a larger plan? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I really don't. And, and again, this gets back to what I said earlier. Um, I was only briefed on this five days before the announcement. Mm -hmm. and, and, it, and that was disappointing because up to that point, uh, decisions that were made by government, um, you know, we, we, we would be briefed, there would be discussions. There would be times where, you know, the, the, the information would come to us and I would simply say, well, you know, you've got ten items here, seven of them are good, three of them we want changed, and here's what we want to see in the bill, or here's what we want to see in the changes of legislation. Now, this, this announcement didn't require legislation, uh, to, to be honest, mm -hmm. but it was significant changes that I was hoping that we could have been a part of. And... Um, one thing I can say is the discussions that I've had with the Premier, that I've had with Cabinet Ministers on different files, we've never breached that confidentiality. When we sit in a room and we, and we negotiate and we go through the changes that are going to happen, uh, I make it very clear to my staff and, and to our caucus knows it, uh, those things are confidential. And, and, you know, so, you know, I don't know if the fear was that it would be leaked or whatnot, and this was leaked, not by us, but someone I would assume within the bureaucracy. Um, but it was disappointing, you know, I said, you know, bring us to the table. We, we've got ideas that we want to share and uh, be part of the solution rather than just simply saying five days before an announcement, here's the plan, I hope you support it. Um, again, we're not in a majority situation. It's got to be held differently. All right. Now, uh, on the lines right now, we have David from Fredericton. Hello, David. Good day. Thanks for putting me on the air. <laughs> Mr. Austin, it's David Amos. Do you remember me? Beg your pardon? Yes. Well, I, I don't think yeah. we've ever met, but I, yeah, through no, email. No, you remember the last time we talked? No, I don't. April of 2010. Okay. Do you remember me telling you about my being barred from the legislature? I don't remember that conversation, no. Are you aware of my lawsuit against the Queen where I sued about that? No. Did you read the email I sent you on February the 14th of last week? What was it regarding? The fact that I don't have a Medicare card and the RCMP are trying to arrest me again. The, the hospitals called me. The CEOs of Vitality called me. You must be aware because I sent you another email in that regard. The CEO of Vitality called you? Yes. So what did he have to say? Well, you were aware that I ran in the last provincial election and the last federal election, correct? Yep. Are you aware that while I was running in the federal election, I was in and out of the emergency room? No. 
you don't read your emails, do you? Okay. So what, what, what? Unfortunately here, uh, since this is going to be including a personal issue having to do uh, between some well, of them. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll help them with we, what's your issue, David. Just tell me what your issue is. I kind of have to move on in a sense. You've got there? my emails. Is he still there? Okay. Now we're going to stick by. Did don't you get my emails or didn't you? I don't know what emails you're referring to. I, David, I get hundreds of emails on a weekly basis. I mean... I'm talking to you on the phone right now, Chris. No, you're talking to me on live TV. <laughs> Are you being funny? Listen. Okay, we got to move on now. Again, since it's regarding, it's getting, it's yeah. regarding a personal issue. I've dealt we with have to him before. Yeah, we have to move on. Now, going back into uh, into what we were talking about earlier, uh, is New Brunswick going in uh, going to be in a perpetual cycle of not being able to close or adjust services due to the potential of losing voters in key rural communities, even if it's necessary for the survival of the healthcare system? Well, there there is that that issue, and uh, you know, again, with the committee that we had with the CEO of Horizon and the CEO of Vitalite they raised that and they raised it very bluntly and very frankly and they said look um, the problem is over the years uh, politicians uh, because of pressure from the public have not been able to move on significant health reforms mm -hmm. and that is a challenge that's not unique to New Brunswick I mean anywhere in the world where you start t you know tampering with health care uh, you know people get passionate and and, and, and I get it again I, I understand my community faced that 18 years ago so I understand it, um, but at some point we do have to say, uh, you know, as as a government, as a legislature, to say first of all to get the ideas out there, ideas that you know can work and that can make sense. I don't think there's a silver bullet to healthcare, and I think what the public needs to understand is what we're facing in New Brunswick is not unique to New Brunswick. It's not like New Brunswick's the only province in Canada that has a nursing shortage or a doctor shortage. As a matter of fact, that's across the country. It's across North America. New Brunswick's in a more precarious situation for two reasons. One, we're the poorest province in Canada, uh, so we don't have the financial resources that the other, some of the other provinces do. And secondly, to make it worse, uh, we have an aging demographic that's going to need more care as years go on. So we have less uh, resources, we have greater need, um, it's, it's, it's very, very difficult uh, to, to be able to sustain. So again, I understand where the CEO of Vitalitane Horizon is coming from. I understand um, you know, what, what you know, doctors and nurses are saying. But I, I do believe that if, if, we can, if we can just put the politics aside and, uh, and, and just calm everything down a little bit and get some of these folks in a room, uh, you know the old saying, you take them, you lock them in a room and you say, you're not coming out till you come up with a solution. Um, you know, I think that's what needs to happen. Get the nurses union in there, get the medical society in there, get the CEOs of these places, get some patients in there that have gone through the system. Um, you know, it's one thing to have people at the top that look at data, but it's equally important to have people that are on the front line of those services every day because they see things that the CEO sitting in a boardroom wouldn't see. So it has to be, you know, a coordinated effort of, of uh, you know, different ideas coming forward. The paramedics should be absolutely a part of that. And we're hearing more and more with this plan that a lot of those things weren't in place. Um, a lot of those organizations uh, uh, weren't part of it. Now, government would say they were. Some of them are saying they're not. So it depends on who you believe. But, uh, um, you know, I, I think it, it has to be a collaborated effort of, of a lot of different people. And, uh, you know, I'm convinced we can come up with some ideas to make it better. All right. Uh, and with that, we have to cut the break here right shortly. So continue with, the, with us as we continue to talk about the current climate of, of politics here in New Brunswick. Do you have something to share? Let everyone know about your next meeting, your need for volunteers, or your fundraising event on the Rogers TV Community Billboard. Send us your words and we'll bring them to life on Rogers TV and RogersTV.com. When it's time to spread the word, 
go to rogerstv.com to add your announcement to the community billboard. It was my daughter's birthday. She was blowing out the candles on her cake when we heard coming from the TV. So we stopped and listened. And it helped us get to safety. That's why when I think of I think of my daughter's birthday. Because now she gets to keep having them. What's up, guys? Chris Dobson, Chris Corey here from New Brunswick's favorite sports show across the line. We talk to everybody from football, golf, hockey, Hall of Fame. It doesn't matter. We always have a great time when we're here in studio. And hey, you never know who's going to drop by. Hey, lots of celebrities, lots of New Brunswick's finest coming by the studio to talk sports. Have a little fun with New Brunswick's favorite sports talk show across the line right here on Rogers TV. I joined because I wanted to help others. To be a part of something bigger. To show my kids what's important. I joined to make my community stronger. To make a difference in someone's life. To acknowledge that our freedoms come at a cost. I joined to honor my mom. My grandpa. My neighbor. Everyone who served. Who are serving still. I joined. I joined. I joined the Legion. Welcome back to Voice of the Province. I'm your host, Troy Glover. Tonight we have Chris Austin, leader of the People's Alliance of New Brunswick, here with us. And tonight we're talking about the current political climate of New Brunswick. Now, continuing on what we're going on with, uh, with hospital services and whatnot, now, when it comes to making decisions on services, does the final say ultimate fall, ultimately fall on the health boards or does it fall on the government? Well, that's a good question. And that's, that's uh, the exact question that I asked uh, the CEO, excuse me, of Horizon Health. I said, you know, you, you as, a, as a board, uh, as a CEO, you manage the health authority. You, you manage staff, you manage uh, everything within it, ultimately. So I asked the very pointed question, you know, could you have proceeded with these reforms without government approval? And the answer I got was they may, they may have had the uh, technical ability to proceed, but they didn't feel like they had the moral ability to proceed without government uh, approval. So. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's two sides to that. Um, you know, government has to let managers manage, but at the same time, uh, government is the representative of the, of the people, and ultimately it's up to the elected officials um, to decide on behalf of the people of the province which way to go. So, you know, I, I think the Minister of Health uh, would be the ultimate authority. Um, again, whether we get into technical details of legal leak, um, you know, could they have proceeded? Possibly, I don't know. Um, but it's, it's, it's hard to say. Okay, uh, on that note, we have another caller on the line. We have Jerry from Riverview. Hello, Jerry. Hi, good evening, how are you? Good, how are Hi, you? Jerry. Excellent. Got a, a question for Chris, and this is looking at two health boards where you have twice the administration, uh, twice all the overhead. Why can't we look at one health board? Uh, we went from eight to four, or eight to two. Couldn't we go to one? Cut out a lot of the administrative, and put that money towards the front end services. That is what we're really looking for. Yeah, Jerry, look, that's exactly what we've been saying for for several years now. Um, and if you look at past reports, when when they when they brought it from from eight down to two, if you look at the recommendations at uh, that time, the recommendations was to go to one, mm -hmm. and you know again take it from eight down to one. Now, what I find interesting is at that time, they decided, the government of the day decided to go with, with uh, two health authorities based on linguistic profile. Now, they'll deny that. They'll say it's got nothing to do with language, but you'd have to be you know, a fool not to see that that's exactly what it is. So what we have said is this isn't, you know, we, we take criticism, Jerry, when we talk about ending duality in the province. And we take it from politicians that try to make hay over it, or you know some some folks uh, that that don't understand where we're coming from. We're not talking about taking away linguistic rights. We're not talking about removing bilingualism. We're not talking about uh, taking anybody's rights away. What we're talking about 
is, 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 is having a system in New Brunswick where all New Brunswickers fall under that system. And whether that uh, relates to school buses, you know, we, we said school buses, in English and French chasing each other around the province, whether it goes to health care, which is in a very precarious situation. I mean, Jerry, you're bang on. I mean, any, any rational person would say it's much easier to manage, it's, it's more resourceful, more efficient to have one system as opposed to two. Excellent. I appreciate that, Chris. You have a great day. Great. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Jerry, for calling in. Now, on another healthcare note, the province recently announced the addition of 72 practical nurses in the province. Uh, what are your thoughts on that exactly? Uh, 32? 32. Yeah, 32 practical nurses. Uh, that was great. Yeah. That, that was a great announcement. Um, that was another thing that we had been pushing for for quite some time. Um, you know, we, we on the campaign trail in 20, uh, 2018, we said, look, we have a massive doctor shortage in this province. We have a wait list in the, in the tens of thousands, um, the people looking for a doctor. So, you know, if you can't get the doctors to the province that, that would meet the need of the wait list, you can implement nurse practitioners, which, you know, can do a lot that, that doctors do today. Not everything, of course, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, they can, they can diagnose a lot of ailments. They can uh, write prescriptions for certain things. They can, they can even refer to specialists in some situations. So nurse practitioners, the announcement of 32 nurse practitioners, I, I thought was, was fabulous. Uh, I commended the Minister of Health on, on uh, you know, bringing that forward. And uh, that will, <coughs> excuse me, that will cut back on the wait list because again, people that don't have a family doctor, if, if you ask most people that don't have a family doctor, you know, would you be willing to, to come under a nurse practitioner while you're waiting for a family doctor, I can pretty much tell you the majority of people would say, well, yes, we will certainly, um, you know, be a patient of a nurse practitioner while we're waiting for a doctor. I know people that, uh, in my area that, um, you know, worked with a nurse practitioner. They were a patient of a nurse practitioner because they didn't have a doctor. And uh, they said it was, it was great, you know, they, they're able to do a lot. And, uh, and you know, a lot of ailments they were able to see. And obviously if it, if it gets beyond what a nurse practitioner is able to do, then they simply refer you to a doctor and, and life carries on. All right. Uh, we're going to be going back to the lines here uh, for a second. We have uh, <coughs> on the line Perry from Dalhousie Junction. Hello, Perry. Hi, how are you? First name... My first name is Sonny. Uh, I didn't give my first name. I apologize for that. <laughs> All right. Anyway, uh, the question that I would like to direct to um, Mr. Austin is, right now, um, I just want to say for one thing, I was in the hospital for three and a half months, and I can tell you in three and a half months, I had a good idea how the systems run. Our number one thing right now in the province is health care. You're so right when we have an aging, uh, an aging population and you have um, uh, a dual duality uh, in the system. If we don't smarten up and take the politics out of our health system, we're the only ones that are going to be hurt in the long run. And I just don't understand, for the life of me, why we're playing with fire, because we're all going to get burnt over this. A province of 750,000 people, how can we keep paying when we're the poorest province in the province, in the, our, our country of Canada? I mean, with all the aging population, there's only so much money to go around. And right now, I mean, you can't borrow from Peter to pay Paul. Well, I would like to find out if, you know, we're going to have another election. That's pretty well for sure. Um, we can't really afford that, but yet we're going to have to do it. Now, politicians realize that they can put their politics aside when we're talking about health care. And my God, so be it. I think we lost him. Did we lose Perry? Mm. Half months that I was shocked. And, you know, okay. I, I, 
Yeah, I didn't catch the last last part there. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, it uh, seems. But I think what what he's saying really is what uh, what we're hearing a lot from people in in the province, and 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 this is this is what's so disheartening is. You know, we, we've we've gotten to a place in in politics where it's just all about the next you know uh, grab at power. It's it's not it's not about what can fix things. It's just how do we get in power? And and, and this is the, again this is the dangerous game that the Liberal Party of New Brunswick is playing today. And and they are. They're, it's it's a game. Make no mistake about it. How do we get power? And they seize the opportunity. It's it's and this is what I mean from 2018 when the first budget was presented. The first budget in 2018 after the election was a balanced budget. For the first time in over a decade, we were actually running a surplus. And you would think at that moment uh, that the opposition parties would have voted in favor of a budget that ran a surplus. But unfortunately, we were the only ones that actually uh, supported the government on a surplus budget. And I'm proud to do that. And, and, I, and, I, and again, th these are the types of things that, that we need to do is I agree 100%, put the politics aside, look at the solutions, collaborate, it's up to government to collaborate, and it's up to us uh, on, on the other side of government to be able to work with them uh, to find solutions. And that's what I've been committed to do, and I can tell you something, I will say it again, if we go to the polls here in the next couple months, it's not going to be our doing. Uh, we've done everything we can to keep, to keep the uh, New Brunswick going forward, the legislature working, and it has been working, um, the government dropped the ball. They absolutely did. Uh, but at the same time, people don't want an election. Let's, let's pick up from this. Let's move on. And uh, let's find solutions for New Brunswick. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Perry, for calling in. We're sorry that we seem to have lost you as well uh, on the line. Uh, but next on the line, we have Wanda from Minto. Hello, Wanda. Hi there. How are you, folks? Hi, Good. Wanda. Hi there. Um, Chris, just wanted to say, like you said, 18 years ago, when our health system, uh, or when our when our hospital closing was converted to the uh, to the community center, I was uh, I was I was very skeptical about that. But it, like you said, it all ended up working out in the long run. The only thing I would like to see is uh, is uh, services on uh, Sunday, like they do on Saturday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point, and and that's a point. Um I, I think that needs to be hit home, and and you're right, Wanda. Of course, being from into yourself, you know, Monday to Saturday, nine to five uh, clinic hours. Sunday would be a great addition, um, something to look at. Yeah, uh, for sure. And you know, I uh, of course I work in Fredericton, and you know, I I've told people that you know that they say, oh, I you know I don't want to go to the back. You have to wait there twelve hours. I said, look, hop in your car, drive to Minto. You can be there in forty five minutes. See a doctor, be out of there in 20 minutes, and be back. Yeah. And no. they've actually done that, and they're just totally amazed at the service that they get here in Minto. Yeah. And the thing is with Wanda, with that too, and, and I, I tell people the same thing. So why would you go to Fredericton? And, and I, I understand if you if you're having chest pains and and you're in like a, like an emergency situation, Minto's probably not the place to go. But if you're looking at a you know an injury or you know something that's a little more minor. Why would you go wait at the deck for six, seven, eight hours when a little 45 minute drive to Minto, you can be in and out of there in an hour? And I want to exactly. further that, and you're, you're absolutely right, Wanda. I want to further that by saying ambulances bypass these little clinics all the time. Now, I understand there's emergency situations. Again, they shouldn't be stopping in Minto. They should be going to, to Fredericton or any rural area should be going to the emergency care. But if it's a minor injury, if it's a, if it's a broken arm or a sprained ankle or whatever else, it should be up to the paramedic to triage that. And if the service is provided at a local clinic like Minto, the, the ambulance should be stopping there and treating the patient uh, without getting tied up in Fredericton, tying up an ambulance, tying up the wait times in Fredericton. Wanda, you're absolutely right. The, 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 the rural clinics that we have today in New Brunswick are underutilized. Um, they're not being used the way they could be used. And rather than taking services away, we should be enhancing those services to take the stress off of the urban areas where, uh, where there's long wait times. Exactly, because I know, like, for example, my dad, he fell and broke his hip. Six weeks later, he had to, being an extramural patient, he got the ambulance. They took him to Fredericton to do an x-ray. He was in with the orthopedic surgeon for not even five minutes and back home again, mm -hmm. where 
it would have not tied up the ambulance so as long, take him to mental do the x-ray, mm-hmm. send the x-ray to the to the orthopedic surgeon in Frederick and the look and say, okay, great, everything's feeling fine. Bang on. Bang on. She's absolutely right. All right, uh, we're going to be moving on now. Uh, thank you so much, Wanda, for calling in tonight. Um, so going off my last question I asked you, should we be accelerating the creation of nurse practitioner jobs in this province? Yeah, I mean, as much as possible. Um, and again, to understand there, there's a nursing shortage across the country. New Brunswick's not unique to that. Um, but we should. I mean, thir- the, you know, again, the announcement of hiring, bringing in 32 extra nurse practitioners, I think was fabulous. Um, I highly commend the Minister of Health and the Premier for moving on that. Um, but, you know, the other side of it is you can always use more. And um, I know uh, immigration consultants, private immigration consultants, they, they bring in nurses from places like the Philippines. What's frustrating is they bring these nurses in from, from other countries. They're, they're trained, they're licensed within their countries. They bring them to New Brunswick and they put them to work at Subway, McDonald's, Tim Hortons, you know, the hospitality restaurant chains. And I'm thinking we have nurses today that are, that are from other countries that are working in hospitality uh, uh, sector instead of working in our hospitals. Now, if there's some upgrade training that they need to do to, to meet the code of New Brunswick, then, then fine. Let's, let's streamline that. Let's, let's make sure we do it right. But, like, to me, it's, it's, it's incredibly baffling that, that we still have nurses today from other countries coming to Canada, coming to New Brunswick, and, uh, you know, putting your Happy Meal together <laughs> rather than working at a hospital where we need them. Uh, basically going to be coming to the end of, for tonight. Um, do you think we're going to be heading into another election here soon? Look, I hope not. I, I really don't. And, and, and to be fair, I haven't seen the budget yet either. And I've been very open to say I want to look at the budget, I want to see the numbers before I make my decision whether to support it or not. Um, but uh, you've got to be open-minded. You, you can't come into this and say we're going we're to bring the house down. Uh, that's just irresponsible. And I hope if we go to an election, that those that play that rhetoric pay for it at the polls because New Brunswickers have got to send a message to these guys that it's not politics as usual. It's a new day and they need to, uh, to, to get up with the times. Now is it possible we go through with an election and at the end of it all we end up right back where similar situation we are right now? Chances are. Yeah. Chances are. I mean, for us, um, I'm quite confident that we can, uh, we can gain seats. Um, I know I've been talking to people all over this province. They're tired of the red and blue. They want to they change. Uh, we're providing that change. I think we've shown ourselves in the last year and a half that, that we're very reasonable, that we're, we want to see bold moves and big action. Um, we haven't quite seen a lot of that, uh, to our disappointment, but nonetheless, we're, we're here to work for New Brunswickers and to represent our people that elected us, and, and we're doing that. And, Look, if, if the Liberal Party of New Brunswick wants to, wants to bring the house down and, and drive people to the polls, yeah, that's their choice, but I, we're ready. Let's, let's do it. All right. And unfortunately, that's all the time we have for tonight um, for everyone. Uh, so thank you, Chris, for joining us tonight. Uh, thanks, for everyone, for tuning in. Uh, uh, we had Chris Austin in tonight. He was the leader's party, uh, uh, P- leader of the People's Alliance of uh, New Brunswick. Tonight we talked about New Brunswick's current uh, climate within the political sector and uh, health care. Uh, I'm your host, Troy Glover. Thank you all for watching, and all of you have a great night. Call the Rogers TV viewer response line, email us, or connect with us on social media. When you become a Rogers volunteer, it's always an opportunity for everybody to come together and try different things that they've never been able to do before. What I've learned here is different skills that I thought I would never even be interested in learning. By being here at Rogers, I can learn all these different things that will help me be stronger. Working here as a volunteer is a good way to get to know your community, 
It's a good way to learn how to work as a part of a team. They're people from our community, so they know and they have a heart for our community to step outside of our comfort zone and do more. Don't be afraid, because this is where you're going to gain the most valuable experience that you can use in your future. I encourage everybody to be a volunteer at Rogers TV because not only do you grow professionally, you grow personally as well. This is Rogers TV, New Brunswick. Hey, did you know? More than 4,500 Canadians are waiting for an organ transplant right now. Right now. 4,500. People are dying. And you could save a life. 90% of Canadians say they're willing to donate their organs.